alter is somebody that, um, so I'm gonna rewind a little bit. I thought a year ago that this whole show this year would be about health and VR. Because for me, fundamentally, what needs to happen is um, we need to get people off of opioids in the US and stop carpet bombing people's problems with SSRIs and beta blockers. Um, I speak from personal experience. Um, when I was much younger, I had terrible, terrible anxiety disorder. And man, if I had taken every single thing that they'd offered me to make it better, I would just be a basket case now. So um, I had to go around the long way and using cognitive behavioral therapy and um, neuro-linguistic programming and sometimes meditation, although I think it's a real pain. But it's, you know, it has its place. I started to find that there were ways of refactoring how I perceive things and perceive the world and how I accommodate my expectations. And um, that's not to say that people who have certain mental illnesses, I'm not gonna give this whole thing, but what I'm saying is I wanted to make this whole show about this very subject. My team said, what we do is we build a bridge between that industry and the developers who can help those people to make those experiences better or the distribution platforms or the people who understand how to get that to the right audiences and have it resonate and connect and get it out of just the research or to make the ones that are trying to jump on the bandwagon be more accountable. So Walter to me was like the, the gold standard and the brass ring I wanted to find and I, I chased the path down until I finally found you on LinkedIn, I think. That's right. Um, I had Skip Rizzo and Skip can't come this year and Stefan Bouchard is coming later today just through serendipity um, that came up two hours or two days ago. So these were the three big guys that I really wanted to get and that is who your keynote speaker is and thank you for being here. Well, I'm, uh, I'm excited to be here and thank you for the, the very kind words. Um, and uh, there are some personal reasons I'm very excited, which, which I'll go into. Uh, why don't we turn down the lights on the slides, maybe the house lights up a little bit. Um, anyhow, let's, let's uh, jump into it. Um, my focus has been for the last 30 years or so on medical applications of virtual reality. So I'm particularly excited to see that things are lurching forward now. Um, when I think about things that we should all worry about, you know, there's, this is what I'm told are the major problems uh, facing all of us. But within that list of four, it's the healthcare crisis, especially that related to aging, that concerns me the most. Um, and the reason is uh, our population has doubled since the 1970s, and yet, we're top heavy. Uh, there's a disproportionate number of aging baby boomers, et cetera, that all we have to do is the math. This isn't science in terms of theory. This is predictable demographics. And we will have a very top heavy population without enough youngsters to support it. And this is a worldwide problem and it could potentially bankrupt um, uh, the world economy. Uh, two out of every seven of us, unless there's major breakthroughs, will have a neurodementia disease once we get to our 70s, 80s, and 90s. And th that's a very expensive problem. Uh, in my opinion, the only way out of this box is technology. We, we can't grow uh, more young people to take care of an aging population, but we can improve technology to do better support. Fortunately, there's a digital health revolution going on. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details about it, but it involves sensors and mobile health, we're switching the point of care from the clinic and the hospital to where the patient is. And there's a big data aspect of it. Right now, every medical device is being transformed from an analog device to a digital device. Uh, even spigmometers and thermometers and spirometers are all being hooked up to the internet. Um, a lot of this is being driven by the quantified self movement. Those are the early adopters. Uh, but this allows us to come up with systems with a, a cloud-based back-end um, pushing uh, assessments and reminders and badges and interventions, such as cognitive behavioral therapy that uh, Kieran mentioned, to uh, the patient, and collecting data and putting it at a point where we can do some predictive analytics and come up with more precision, individual-specific uh, interventions. So instead of a one-size-fits-all approach, we, we now have a precision, analytically-based system. 
uh, the potential for looking at this data and un identifying subpopulations and the correct treatment protocols is astonishing. Uh, but where does VR fit in? Well, um, my position is that VR is going to have a tremendous role to play in this digital healthcare revolution, and, and I'll explain why. Um, I feel that although entertainment and gaming and all the other wonderful things that are driving the initial surge forward of VR technology, it, as it moves over to the enterprise, the medical vertical is going to be one of the strongest uh, and most important verticals for, for VR. And, and to the extent I'm here to help entice, cajole, seduce, uh, recruit people here in this room to help pay attention to the medical market. I think it's going to be very important. Um, we've had 30 years of research and development on understanding where VR can be applied to medical problems, mostly at university-based uh, research centers. Uh, and it's gradually escaping from those centers and coming out into clinical care now, um, now that VR is affordable. And it's the full stack of, of care that is being affected by this. Um, starting at prevention and wellness, better assessments, and this is key, improved interventions. We can facilitate adherence to clinical protocols, which if you can't get the, the individual to adhere to a protocol, it, it's no good having a protocol, but VR can help us there. And also pushing um, uh, care delivery out to where the individual is. Um, and here's the personal reason that I'm very excited to be here. I, I got involved back in 1984 in VR, back when I was a grad student with shaggier hair. We all had shaggier hair back in the 80s. Uh, and so for me to see the transformation is just incredible. Back in the day, we used um, uh, computers that cost half a million dollars and were the size of a small refrigerator. And we used head-mounted displays that were uh, so top-heavy that we had to counterbalance them with a brick. Um, but now, you know, we, we have better systems. I, I tried back in 2008 saying I thought the technology was ready then for clinical care, and I went to uh, China after the 2008 earthquake where there were more than 50,000 people affected with post-traumatic stress, and I trained some of the clinicians on how to use VR to help do post-traumatic stress uh, treatment using VR. Unfortunately, it, it couldn't scale. The, the cost was such that we could not address the extreme needs of the population. However, if there was a disaster of similar magnitude today, and in many ways there are in some of the combat zones that are going on and refugee camps, uh, we can use VR technology to help. Um, so after 30 years of research and development, uh, v now is the year for VR. And, and I won't belabor this point. You, you already know, you've already heard how billions of dollars are being spent by all the major tech companies. Uh, and, but that's to our advantage. We can leverage that technology and push it into the enterprise and push it into medical care. And I'll give you some examples. A and by the way, when I say VR, I also include AR and um, uh, mixed media and, and all aspects of three-dimensional interactive uh, I uh, interaction. Uh, to me, um, it's just a spectrum of immersion. And uh, I view it all as part of one continuum. Um, including some room-based systems where we don't have to wear a head-mounted display, where we capture movement and we have people interact with 3D interactive data. And as was pointed out uh, earlier, uh, there's a huge surge forward of software development companies that are paying attention to this market too. So it's not just the enabling um, hardware technology, but there's some fantastic software uh, being developed too. Um, there's recently been some major investments in VR for healthcare. Uh, the big one is MindMaze, which uh, raised uh, $100 million at a $1 billion valuation, astonishingly. Uh, Reflection Health has, I think, raised about uh, $20 million. Uh, Limbix is backed by Sequoia, and uh, they're doing really well with a, uh, a key uh, venture backer. And Paratherapeutics has raised, I, I believe, around $20 million to use VR for clinical applications. But that's, that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of startups out there working on it. As a matter of fact, um, I added up the number of startups that I've had some sort of interaction with and have had a chance to get to know what they're doing. And there's more than 72 that I've talked to out there, all focusing on medical VR in 18 different clinical categories. So the spectrum of targets is large, which is fantastic. And as you know, uh, the adoption curve for VR is significant. Uh, there's a projection that within three years, we'll have more than 30 million users. Uh, a lot of that is mobile VR, of course, but it is significant. And I think those actually are very conservative estimates. But the good news is we've had uh, decades of research. If you go to PubMed and do a search on VR and a clinical problem, you'll find uh, a stack of research literature. It may be 
done with previous technology that needs to be revalidated, but the protocols, the heuristics, the algorithms, the blind alleys versus the salient pathways, that's all been worked out, and it's available for you to leverage and build upon. So previously, the technology was expensive and bulky, and I think more importantly, it was also hadn't been socialized. Uh, uh, VR sounded too game-like and strange to be talked about in a clinical context, but I think we're over that threshold now. I, d I don't think people will be um, uh, allergic to the concept of seeing virtual reality and medical in the same uh, breath now. So I'm going to give some examples. Again, the spectrum is, is large, uh, starting with health and wellness and prevention, improved training, uh, improved assessments, um, and improved uh, interventions. In the area of training, it, it, it's, uh, we have examples uh, running the gambit. Uh, everybody tends to think of surgical skill training, and, and there are some really profound um, um, areas there where we can train a surgeon how to use an instrument and, and design a pr surgical procedure. But it, it's broader than that. We, we teach team training, how a team can work together. We train um, nurses and uh, physicians how to use equipment, uh, especially as the equipment changes, it, they need to have refreshed training. Uh, we do team training. I saw a fantastic example of, of a city rehearsing um, in a multi-user virtual environment how to respond to a, a dirty bomb explosion. And they had the police department, the fire department, the hospital staff, uh, the mayor's office, all coordinating in a virtual environment how to respond to an emergency. And, of course, uh, one of the big uh, things that people are very excited about is that because we can show the world from somebody else's point of view, we can help people who are professionals uh, understand what it's like to be a customer of that professional to teach empathy. Uh, now, we've had for decades some very expensive um, medical VR systems used for clinical uh, skill training. Uh, for example, this knee uh, arthroscopic uh, simulator. These have been at simulations, and we never called it virtual reality. Uh, again, because people were a bit allergic to the phrase, we, we called it uh, surgical simulation or medical simulation. Um, but we've had uh, systems and tools to tra train with haptic feedback and very precise uh, 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 visualizations, almost indistinguishable from working on a real knee. Uh, how, to, how to do uh, arthroscopic repair, for example. But these have been in multi-million dollar facilities that people would fly in and spend the weekend. Very expensive process to, to be trained on these simulators. Now it's being pushed out to the clinic, to the hospital, so people can practice a procedure, rehearse a procedure in advance. Uh, here's just one example of a system called by a company called Oso that's used to train uh, and rehearse placing a tibial nail um, so that if you are about to do the procedure and you want to rem rem remember how to do the right sequence of using the tools, you can rehearse it at the clinic. So this is using a Vive system, obviously. And he's just uh, practicing the sequence that he needs to do of placing the, the tools in the right sequence and the right way. So he doesn't have to go to a surgical training center to get a refresher course on how to use that particular piece of equipment. And it's not just the sequencing, he gets the muscle memory of how to do the procedure. Um, we also have uh, systems that have been used to train uh, nurses and teams of clinicians how to handle procedure. Here's just a quick one on um, by a company called Clinispace that was used to show how to prep a patient for dialysis. And in this case, it's gamified a little bit. There's, uh, you know, it hooks into a educational management system and there's progress and skill sets that are mastered as the, um, as the learner learns how to go through a sequence. Um, the same technology that's used for training can be used for planning. And right now, clinicians are fusing data from F fMRI and MRI and CAT scan images and planning a surgical, complex surgical procedure and rehearsing it in advance. Um, the next area that I think is particularly important is better assessments. Right now, especially for cognitive function, a lot of our assessments are done um, subjectively, either subjectively by the patient self-reporting or maybe an observer reporting uh, the cognitive status of the patient. Uh, not very accurate, not very reproducible, not very standardized. But we can improve that with the use of virtual reality and standardized assessment worlds. 
So better neuropsychological assessments. We can also measure functionally activities of daily living, the post-discharge for a patient. Uh, that's going to have a big impact on physical medicine, occupational therapy, physical therapy. And the big area, and I'm going to spend some time on this, is behavioral medicine, psychology and psychiatry. Much better assessments of mood state and cognitive function. So uh, there's a huge uh, opportunity here to set the next level of standards to come up with the virtual worlds, the virtual environments that are going to be part of these next generation of cognitive assessments that uh, assess our executive functions, our behavior, our mood, our, interaction, our social interactions in a quantifiable, reproducible, standardized way. This is really going to make a big difference. Um, but we also have um, uh, already migrated out into the clinical world a number of um, interventions. Um, for example, um, well, this is just a list, and, and these are in use right now. These, you can go to a clinic and use VR to help with the problems I'm about to list out. Uh, in the area of physical medicine, uh, stroke rehabilitation, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, traumatic brain injury recovery, um, op optical rehabilitation, there are systems to help with strabismus and amblyopia, um, acute and chronic pain, this is a big one, and weight management. But the list goes on. Now we're moving more into the area of mental and behavioral health. But we have effective systems that have been, are being used to help with uh, addictions, drug and alcohol, uh, help with psychosis such as uh, schizophrenia, um, post-traumatic stress, we've ha had a lot of work in this area, um, generalized anxiety disorder, depression, mild cognitive impairment, autism, attention deficit disorder, um, the list goes on, phobias, anxiety disorders, uh, um, impulsive disorders, learning disabilities. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole list, but it's a large list and it keeps going. And uh, but I will give you some specific examples. Uh, next, the area is health and wellness to help with prevention and maintenance after discharge of a clinical problem. And um, w we've had some great examples of how VR can be used to help with palliative care, to help with addressing grief and isolation, um, mood and resilience, um, promoting exercise. Um, and this one's pretty interesting, too, because I think it strays over to uh, uh, areas that uh, are going to be adopted pretty rapidly for peak performance, uh, using VR to teach people uh, what, as neuroscientists, we call executive fu functions, uh, how to have better situational awareness, uh, proper sequencing, and being able to make a rapid decision, and how to modulate your moods in a crisis situation. And another po thing to keep in mind is that VR can be a portable telemedicine system. So again, we can push clinical care out to where the clinic is. And that's going to be very important for serving underserved populations or reaching to refugee camps, for example, or reaching to a, um, uh, you know, someone who lives downtown in a high rise but has uh, uh, a knee injury and has trouble getting into the clinic. Uh, VR is a potentially very powerful telemedicine platform. And it's not just the VR hardware and software that are enabling this uh, breakthrough. Um, our friends who are working in AI and developing uh, voice recognition and virtual human technologies are also contributing to this, and it's a big part of it. This is an example of uh, uh, a virtual human that um, the group at ICT at USC has developed. Uh, I'll show a very quick video uh, clip, but what you'll see is this is a virtual therapist as opposed to a virtual patient, but she's an AI system. Um, she's interviewing a real patient, but the AI system is capturing facial expression, gaze direction, voice tone, body language, and scoring it. And those scores are being fed back to the AI system to um, change the direction of the interview. This is great for training, of course. Uh, it can also be used for um, when, when a patient might be uh, worried about stigma and isn't ready to talk to a person in real time. Perhaps a system like this can help uh, in the meantime. It also, we can flip it around the other way, and we could have this be a virtual patient so that a clinician can practice and learn um, effective skills on. So I'll show you the clip really briefly. Hi, I'm Ellie. Thanks for coming in today. Maybe we can I turn the volume up a bit. Talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? Yes. 
So, how are you doing today? So she's doing well. The AI assistant's building a rapport now. Where are you from originally? I'm from Los Angeles. Oh, I'm from LA myself. When was the last time you felt really happy? Uh, when was the last time? So the system is paying attention to the tone of his voice, his gaze direction, scoring uh, this in real time. Yeah. I'm not someone who's really like, I don't have any real high highs. I feel like I'm a level person. It's just... So we have also know that people will say things to an AI system that they wouldn't say to um, uh, a real person. It, and it's, it's a way for us to have uh, ways of screening patients and maybe reaching patients who aren't ready to talk to a clinician. And again, it's a great training system. Let me give you some further examples. Um, in the field of anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, phobias, anxiety disorders, we've had some fantastic uh, results using VR for exposure therapy. In this case, we're taking what is a learned fear reaction, uh, a limbic system reaction, and we're training the, uh, the patient how to react to the triggers, the stimulus, in a, in a more modulated frontal cortex way. But to do that, we need to be able to slow down the triggers that uh, the patient responds to and gradually ha habituate him or her to that exposure. It works, but it's something that's very difficult, if not impossible, to do with imagination. If I'm asking you to imagine the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to you, something that you're very afraid of, both because of the experience but also because of your subsequent reactions, your brain doesn't want to go there. But if I take you there gradually um, using a virtual environment, I can get you to think about those things that are triggering that fear reaction, teach you the coping skills, and habituate that fear response, and, and it works. So we've had great results with fear of heights, fear of flying, uh, fear of driving, um, for sexual trauma, and for combat post-traumatic stress. Um, so this is something that's um, best done in an office setting. Uh, there are some people who are trying to uh, develop systems that can be used uh, in a telemedicine manner for this, using biosensors. Uh, I think that's best used for things like fear of public speaking as opposed to something that's uh, a little bit more of a, of a clinically related trauma. But we've had some great results in this area and it, it's only going to get better. Um, another area that we've had some fantastic progress in is uh, better cognitive assessments. Uh, this is a system that's a virtual classroom that's used to do an objective assessment for attention deficit disorder. And as opposed to a paper and pencil test, we're, we're getting a lot of very good um, quantified data of attention, not just uh, what is the patient uh, paying attention to, but uh, um, how long are they paying attention, where are they looking, and with some big data analytics, we should be able to parse out different traits and subtypes. I'll, I'll just show a quick videotape of this too. Attention evaluation system consists of a virtual classroom environment and utilizes the standard continuous performance test with multimodal instructions as well as motion detection of the head, arm, and leg. The user takes a 13-minute test in the VR environment. So it's utterly compatible with current tests. Test as well as all movement data are recorded. A test report is issued immediately that contains a personalized data analysis with clear data visualization. This may help parents receive a fast screening and assist clinicians to evaluate the ADHD diagnosis objectively. And at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned how concerned I am and we all should be about the fact that we have an aging population. Nicely enough, um, some of the things that we can do with virtual reality map very well to the problems that are in an aging population. We can do better assessments. Um, we can address isolation and loneliness, which is almost as uh, deadly for um, isolated seniors as uh, heart disease or smoking is. Uh, we can help with acute and chronic pain. I'll, I'll give some examples of how we do that. Uh, we can help with depression and anxiety, stroke rehabilitation and physical therapy. Um, we can design buildings for disabilities. There's a group I'm working with where uh, they build 6,000 new uh, centers for senior living a year We've built a VR system to help them design for macular degeneration, 
or what it's like to use their facility if you're in a wheelchair or a walker. Uh, so the architect can actually use a walker to go from one room to the other in the virtual environment, see what it's like. Uh, we can use um, VR to help with post-discharge follow-up so that the patient doesn't come back to the hospital unnecessarily. And again, we can do staff training, not just for the specific uh, procedures, but also, um, and I'll get into this a little bit later, about how we can teach uh, someone to have empathy for someone of a different generation. Um, we've also had fantastic results with helping with um, addictions and substance abuse, uh, alcohol, smoking, um, marijuana, uh, cocaine, um, um, just about every substance we've uh, developed a virtual environment. We even have a virtual crack house that we can use to teach uh, situational confidence and refusal skills. We can put someone in a virtual party scene and have them practice how to say no to peer pressure, for example. Um, Something else that's very exciting is, uh, is uh, stress inoculation, uh, preparing someone for who's likely to experience a trauma, like a first responder or some, a scientist going into uh, a, um, an area to research a, an endemic. Uh, maybe they've never been camping, and we can help them be prepared for going into a small village in Africa, for example. Um, we've taken this concept of stress inoculation, and we've applied it, uh, and I'm very excited about this project, um, to helping children who are scheduled for a cardiac procedure. This is a project we call uh, Project Braveheart. Uh, it's with the Stanford Children's Hospital. We, we know weeks in advance for some children who are scheduled for heart surgery what the worst day of their life is going to be. And what we do is we give them a VR system to take home weeks in advance. And on that VR system, we've uh, put a tour of the whole hospital and everything that's going to happen to them. But probably most importantly, we've green screened in the images of other kids who've gone through the procedure who can serve as guides. And we have also bundled in some meditation and relaxation skill training so they can learn to relax. But probably most importantly is, is seeing what's going to happen in advance, getting familiar with the layout of the hospital, meeting some of the clinicians. This reduces the anticipatory anxiety quite a bit. And we're in the process of studying its effectiveness right now. We're collecting cortisol and other measurements of stress, both subjective and objective. And We'll see. Uh, it does it help to provide children with this uh, VR system in advance? It, here's a quick video describing the project. Maybe turn up the volume for this a bit. Braveheart is an interactive VR experience developed to reduce stress levels in children who will be undergoing a surgical procedure. Patients and their families are guided through a 360 degree video tour of the hospital by a virtual companion. The gender-specific tour guide provides a friendly, approachable, and relaxing tour of the facility and introductions to doctors and key hospital staff. Along the hospital tour, patients visit the key rooms they'll encounter on the day of their procedure to help make the unknown more familiar. Children learn about parts of the procedure and can even practice mindfulness and relaxation exercises. The intuitive software design allows the user to navigate through scenes and applications, learning the hospital layout, all within Braveheart at their own pace, creating a first of its kind, interactive and immersive video environment. We're collecting a lot of data about utilization. Sense, anonymous usage analytics are stored and available by scene, time, and engagement for analysis by doctors and researchers. So I What's exciting about this for me is that uh, not only do I suspect it will have strong impact in reducing anxiety uh, for both the children and their family members, because the family members also use the technology, uh, it's an example of a good use of case of VR that was easy to do. Uh, it was 360 video with some green screened in um, uh, actors. Um, it didn't take us very long to produce this, it didn't cost us very much to do, and yet I think it's going to have a, a big impact. So it's one example of how one could take VR technology and directly apply it today to an important clinical problem. Uh, another example of something that's not very hard to do and has a great impact is using VR for pain distraction. We've been doing this for decades, starting with uh, the work of Hunter Hosman, who showed that we can significantly reduce the use of narcotics and opiates in a burn clinic, for example, when uh, someone is having their wound debrided, which has to be done on an uh, almost daily basis. Uh, we can use VR as a very effective distraction. Um, it decreases the pain-related brain activity. We can see that with fMR and imaging. And there's no pharmacological side effects, of course. Um, 
what we've learned is that the pain reduction isn't just a, a novelty. It isn't just the first few times you use it. It persists over multiple times. Um, we know that fully immersive systems are, are more effective than less immersive. And actually, if the intervention is passive, pain can actually increase if you're uh, trying to have someone. So you have to have an active, immersive uh, system to distract from the pain. And there's one patient I saw recently who um, had what we call a degloving incident. He was in his go-kart and his skin got pu peeled off of his left arm. He would not let the clinicians touch his arm at all. Uh, in order to clean his wound and take care of it, they had to literally anesthetize him and knock him out. We gave him a VR system. We taught him how to use it. Um, and he, I didn't bring this video because of patient confidentiality, but if I were to show it to you, you would see him just using his VR system, looking all over, and meanwhile, they're taking care of his wound without any narcotics at all. Uh, the, the VR was a complete substitute for any need for pain medication as they took care of his wound. We can also use VR to help um, train people for difficult conversations. Um, might be, you know, uh, I should have used this when I was learning how to ask someone out on a date when I was 16. <laughs> but um, in this case, we're using this to um, train uh, clinicians how to talk about a terminal illness to a family. Uh, in this case, we also green screen the patient rather than um, having it be a computer generated avatar so we can get the micro expressions of the face. Um, so it, you can over-prepare for rare situations that where the patient might get violent or very upset. Uh, it's like a flight simulator, but for a difficult conversation. Let's see what she says. I'm so scared of getting breast cancer. I don't know how I can handle this. This is really hard news to hear. So we're coming up with a library of different situations for a clinician because it's the sort of thing you don't want to learn on the job. You, you really want to be prepared for that first very difficult conversation and know how to do it with agility and with uh, empathy for, uh, for the patient. Uh, VR is a fantastic way for us to teach empathy and uh, there's some amazing things that are being developed right now to help with that. Uh, because I'm a neuroscientist, I'm going to have to ask you to bear with me while I explain some of the neuroscience behind why VR is so effective, particularly in behavioral medicine. Um, and it's, it's pretty nice leverage of the capacity of, of, of both how our brain works and how um, VR technology, uh, what it affords us to do. Uh, in order to change a brain system, a cognitive function, you have to be able to activate that cognitive function. And again, if I just ask you to imagine something that's very scary or something that makes you sad or something that makes you angry, it's very hard for your brain to go there just using your imagination. If I give you the scaffolding to do it with a VR system, I can activate that brain system. And if I can activate that brain system, I can change it. But you have to act, the brain works by building connections and we have to activate those connections in order to basically reprogram the brain. Um, but in order to activate neuroplastic change, we have to use reward systems. That's how um, change is reinforced. We have to shorten the feedback loop. Uh, it's not enough to imagine that you're going to lose weight by exercising. You, you really need to see it and feel it. We can do that with VR. And we can leverage our mirror neuron systems, which are the part of our social brain that allows us to recognize emotions in other people. These are all parts of the brain that we can activate using VR very effectively. And the reason for this is that um, we need to have repetition, and repetition can get boring unless we change it up and make it engaging uh, using a VR system. Um, we have to activate the brain's reward systems. Um, and there's three major reward systems, um, the cholinergic, the neuroadrenergic, the dopaminergic system. And these are driven by attention, by novelty, and by reward. And there's a whole bunch of different rewards, like social reward or competition, etc. cetera. But, um, VR is particularly adroit at activating all those systems. Um, we can grab people's attention, we can put them in novel environments, and we can make it pleasurable and rewarding to be in those VR environments. And here's un the unfortunate thing uh, about how our brains work, and this is something to keep in mind as you design your systems, not just for medicine, but really for anything. Um, our brains are not designed for us to be have pleasure from accomplishment as much as they are designed for um, the pursuit. 
So it's the pursuit that activates these reward systems. And it's a big ripoff. It's, that's why it's so difficult to stay happy in the moment. Um, but we can leverage the fact that it's that pursuit. Uh, the journey is the reward sort of paradigm and design that into our systems. Um, VR leverages mirror neuron systems. Uh, here's one uh, technique we use in my lab where we leverage mirror neuron systems by showing the future self. We age progress an image of yourself. We have you since spend some time in a virtual environment, uh, maybe 10 minutes, uh, looking at a virtual mirror and seeing your avatar do things. After a certain amount of time, you bond with your avatar and you perceive it as you. And then we can flip and we can see what it's like for you to be in a, a body of someone who's of a different gender or different ethnic background and what it's like to have someone discriminate against you. We can also have you pay attention to how your behavior affects the health and happiness of your future self. Uh, we did one experiment, and most of these studies have been with Stander Stanford undergraduates, uh, unfortunately. And, but they, believe me, they're very scared when they see an image of their future self. Uh, <laughs> it, just five years older is scary. Um, but we didn't study where we gave them some money. And we, those students who didn't get to know their future self um, um, spent the money. Uh, those who got to know their future self put some money aside for retirement. And it's that image of knowing and really feeling what your behavior does to your future self that can motivate change and adherence to a protocol. There's some exciting technology coming out right now called NEARS, which I think is going to really impact what we're doing here. Uh, this is near-infrared near spectroscopy. It's a non-invasive, portable, low-cost, relatively low-cost way of measuring brain activity. And it's very compatible with VR systems. It allows us to measure blood flow in the brain and score it and see what parts of the brain are active without having to go into a machine with a big magnet. Um, it's optimal for pediatric populations. There's no radioactivity or, or anything else involved. We can study the behavior of groups of people and how they work together with each other. Um, it's portable for active tasks. And we could even have people driving a car while wearing the system. Uh, it's a fantastic way, and it's, you know, now it costs, I think, anywhere between $10,000 to $100,000 for a high-end system. But eventually, we'll have systems that are as portable as, as an iPhone. And what can we do with that? Well, we can reinforce, um, by knowing what the brain is doing, we can reinforce um, behavior change. And VR is going to be a big part of it. Uh, part of our research right now at uh, Hadi Hosini's lab at Stanford is to use VR to create an engaging virtual environment that's more ecologically valid and try using those VR environments to change and reinforce changes in the function of the brain. And he's getting some fantastic results. So that's just a sampling of some of the things that are going on in medical VR. Um, again, I'd, I'd like to emphasize that there's been almost 30 years of basic research that if you're interested in this field, you can leverage. Um, the work's already been done. Now the technology is affordable, the challenge is reproducing those studies in um, using current technology, but more importantly, pushing them out into clinical care. Uh, because it reduces costs, because it improves results, I, I think there's a great pathway for VR technology to migrate out there, and, and I hope I've piqued your interest in the topic. Um, we have a conference coming up in the fall at Stanford on virtual reality and behavior change. I, I would love it if you folks uh, could come out and join us there. Um, it's October 6th and 7th, and that's my talk. I, I think I'm a few, a few minutes ahead of schedule because I did go through things sort of rapidly, so if it's okay with the conference organizers, I'd love to take a few questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, please. That's a very good question. Because we're measuring um, people's learning skills, uh, in the past we've always had one size fits all. There, here's the classroom, you have to adapt to it or else you're, there's a problem. Um, but you're right, we can use uh, the technology to understand what is the best way for an individual to learn. At the Stanford Virtual Human Lab, we did an interesting project of learning dyads, 
we took teacher and student pairs and um, we measured um, movement uh, using some of the VR motion sensing technology. We didn't have a head, head mount display, it was just two people interacting with each other. And we were able to identify in advance what was going to be a um, effective learning dyad uh, by doing some big data analytics uh, to a pretty high degree of 78% precision. We could figure out what were effective learning pairs. It's just one example of how we can use technology to improve the paradigm of learning. So uh, that's, that's a big issue. Yes? Uh, thanks for doing this report. And this, by the way, is uh, fantastic. Just the conversation we've had um, understanding being a father and understanding uh, how powerful VR experiences are and wondering if there if are any studies or anything that you're aware of that thinks about the impact of this, this powerful medium on developing brains. That's a very, very good question. Um, we don't know. The science isn't there yet. Um, I, I can tell you my hunch as a neuroscientist as how things will play out, but we have not done the research. I mean, the issue is that we're putting a television screen very close to the eyes, and we're changing the whole vestibular ocular reflex system based on that. And we just don't know um, what the long-term effects are, especially on the developing brain. Uh, as, as our brains mature, we learn how to recognize distances, um, recognize uh, uh, how to move about the world. And if we spend, and I, you know and I know that there's going to be some parents who work three jobs and their children spend, are going to be parked in front of a VR system to entertain them for the day. I, the optimist in me says it's going to be a little bit about like sea legs that, or driving your car where we get into a certain mode when we're in VR and then we step out of that mode and we learn to um, interact and perceive the world in a different way. But the realist in me, the realist in me thinks that we're going to have some challenges that, and we should really limit the amount of time that children spend in VR. And not just because of the optical uh, brain interaction, but also children have trouble distinguishing uh, reality from uh, non-reality. And uh, it, um, I, I think there are some unaddressed issues in this area. So it's, it's a very important question. Um, yes. Right. I think VR technology is a particularly powerful way of, of changing our brains and our behavior. And that can be used for good or it can be used for bad. And uh, I, I would love to see the industry come up with some sort of code and some sort of um, um, recommendations. Facebook doesn't re uh, suggest that children under 13 not use uh, VR systems. It's not because of any science. It's because of their Facebook restrictions of um, not having children be on Facebook. That gets carried over to Oculus. Um, I would love to have the industry actually step in about violence, about because this is a very powerful technology. So uh, I, I agree with your concern. I, I don't have a good answer for it, unfortunately. Yes. It's a good question, and I do have an answer. Um, the question was, what are some of the major challenges for um, VR uh, technology as applied to uh, the medical arena? Social VR right now. W with the current wave of technology, we're not very good at putting more than one, peop more than one individual in a virtual environment, and we're also not very good at nonverbal communication, uh, the facial expressions, the body language, um, uh, the inter personal interactions. Uh, uh, if I'm standing in a virtual environment and talking to someone else and s another avatar comes up. Uh, as humans, we automatically turn and sort of adjust our behavior without even thinking about it towards that person. We don't have those algorithms baked into our VR systems yet. We don't have good facial expressions. We don't have 
So there's a lot more that needs to be built in in terms of social interactions, in my opinion. Um, other than that, I, I think the technology is, is, you know, we've got our arms in, we've got our legs in, um, uh, we'll soon we'll have our facial expressions. I, I think the technology is, uh, is, is pretty good, but I, I really do see a barrier right now by not having very good um, non-player characters and also not having very good ways of putting the full body, including body language and facial expressions, into a virtual environment. But people are working on it. Yes, please. Um, I guess the answer there will be to have different size head-mounted displays. Um, I, you know, in our research lab, we have done some children with, uh, studied children, and we've um, adapted some of the head-mounted displays to fit them, but I, I don't think there are any, but you know Disney's going to be coming up with uh, systems, there's going to be VR systems designed for children. Um, I also don't think we always have to have a head-mounted display. I, uh, augmented reality might be the best way for children to interact uh, with a virtual environment. Also, it we'll soon have glasses that uh, overlay the, the real world with virtual information. And so I think we'll have a spectrum of solutions. But right now, it, we don't have a very good solution for children. But people are working on it, especially toy manufacturers. Yes, please. I heard the last part of your question, but not the beginning. A lot of your earlier bonds were affected by cost and scalability. How big an issue is that now? Oh, cost and scalability. Uh, I think it's almost, a, uh, uh, I won't say a trivial concern, but it's not the major concern. The cost of a mobile VR system is, I mean, still it's difficult to send a patient home with something that might cost $1,000. But as our phones become um, VR platforms in five years, probably everybody will already have a potential VR platform. So... Is that my signal to leave the stage? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we have a few more minutes. So I, I think cost is is less of an issue right now. I, I you know I I think in medicine we really need to have um, things be extremely low cost, and so we're not quite there yet. But for the for solving some of these difficult problems that have not been able to be solved uh, before, uh, for example, I'll just use stroke rehabilitation as a system. For home rehabilitation post-stroke, we often get uneven results. If VR can prevent a permanent disability, then it's worth the cost. Yeah, so it, it really depends on the use case, but I, I think we're getting there. Okay. Well, well I'll ask you guys. Oh, all right, one more. Uh, sure. Um, at a conference a few years ago, um, um, somebody was talking about the problem of simulator sickness, and they were saying that they, they were, you know, trying to solve it. Um, and I said, you know, that's a problem that we came up with some hacks for, some tricks, uh, 10 years ago, and here's where you can find it. And uh, I think it saved them probably several million dollars worth of uh, design work. Because, uh, you know, we, with the low... And with the high cost, low vis resolution systems that we had before, we had to be very creative to deal with some problems. And, and there are some, some useful tricks that we found um, and did find that, that are really out there in, in the public domain to just be studied. But because VR has become so visible so rapidly now, most people don't realize that there's a history of work. Yeah. Yes. That's a, yeah, I, really for the last 30 years I've been saying in five years we'll have this, and I've been wrong every time. So I'm, I'm not very good about predicting the future. 
But I think that what I would love to see is us be able to um, have systems that really are tailored personally to my health care issues. So if I'm someone who is um, perhaps struggling with alcohol and my cell phone is aware of my location and I start going into a bar, maybe um, my daughter pops up in my glasses and says, Dad, remember you promised you weren't going to drink again. Uh, or maybe um, if I'm trying to motivate myself to, uh, to eat healthier, maybe when I'm going through a grocery store, um, my, uh, my, my glasses will um, highlight those things that are healthy. I don't know. Actually, that sounds a little bit obnoxious. Um, <laughs> uh, it'd be nice if all this was sort of in the background. You know, like right now we're coming up with some, uh, VR is a very powerful technology for improving health, but it, we shouldn't have to feel like it's an effort. And, and I'd, right now we have this term digital health, which I'd like to see it go away because I think that technology should just be part of healthcare instead of a separate category. So that would be my hope, is that we're not really talking about VR for health. We're just talking about health, and VR is part of it. Yes? First of all, thank you for bringing so many uh, dimensions to healthcare and VR. Uh, really, really uh, amazing. Uh, is there any issue that uh, you have personally uh, that you are really uh, excited about and uh, a solution to offer in the uh, I'm personally... I'd love, if, I don't think it'd be very hard to come up with some great solutions to help uh, people with autism, on the autism spectrum. We can um, use VR to exaggerate facial expressions and nonverbal uh, behavior. We can uh, teach social interactions with slow down the speed of the world. There are some groups working on this, and I can't wait till that gets out. Um, I also think that, again, with an aging population, um, I, I think something that connects people I'd also would love to see us reach out into some of the refugee camps with some systems that we can use to help people who've had the post-traumatic stress. We've been treating our, our combat vets with for post-traumatic stress, but we really should address uh, civilian populations. I would love to see some work be, be done in that area, and, and there's no reason not to. We can push mindfulness, relaxation technology, and other things to help. We know that those are powerful tools, and there's no technical barrier to getting them out. Oh, the conference at Stanford in October, it's mostly, it's more on, it's going to be an academic conference where we have scientists coming and speaking specifically about VR for behavior change. Uh, it's, if you go to the website, uh, um, it, it has a list of the speakers and things like that. It, it's, it's, I think we're going to do it differently next year. This year we designed it for continuing a medical education credit for clinicians. So we had to reduce the amount of exhibits and vendors and things like that. And that, uh, we're not going to have as much cool stuff shown. It, uh, it's mostly going to be academic talks, but I think if you can come, you, you'd enjoy it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. But they easily can customize the VR for the situation of the patient. So glad to know we're in the right direction. Oh, you certainly are, and glad, glad to know you're working on it. For two years in a clinical environment, and we're preparing now to go to market. So Fantastic. Great. Good. Okay. Wonderful. I, I think, and there's a lot of room. Medicine is a huge, it's what, 18% of our economy now? So there's a lot of room for, for people to bring innovations to it. So very glad to hear about your work. We're all going to be there one day. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us sooner than others. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Uh, one thing that's happening with uh, our cell phones, our sensors are being built today that are available right now. For example, our, uh, the iWatch is monitoring on my heart as I speak. Uh, there are devices that will give me feedback on my uh, blood pressure, uh, my weight, etc. Uh, uh, what I'm talking about are sensors. Are there sensors that you've developed for uh, brain uh, function that could be available right now to the uh, wireless? Uh, I, 
Well, actually, heart rate tells us a lot about our brains. Heart rate variability is an index of sympathetic ver versus parasympathetic tone, which is a great index of stress and uh, anxiety. So just using some peripheral sensors, we know a lot about what's going on up here. Also, location, your behavior, where you go, how, much, how active you are, who you socialize with, tells us a lot about you. Um, that NEARS technology that I mentioned right now, I think it can, you can get a low-end system for about $10,000, but when I talk to some of the experts, they say, we can get that down to $1,000 soon. So, and that's measuring brain function directly. So um, uh, there's some, some powerful measurement technologies we can do both passively and actively, and, and more on the way. Well, Clint, you're through that question. If we get the sensors and combine that to with our virtual reality uh, environment, uh, you'll, you'll get biofeedback from viewing a VR situation. Mm -hmm. You could actually modify the VR to uh, react to how you're reacting to it. Absolutely. Absolutely, and uh, I think I think that one of the big opportunities is because of that we have to reinvent how we measure brain function and mood and all the things that we measure that are in the psychological psychiatric space. And there's a fantastic opportunity for people to establish the new standard intelligence test and anxiety test, depression test. Uh, that whole area of paper and pencil questionnaires is going to be reinvented because we can measure and behavior and dynamically change the environment. And I'd love to see us develop a virtual environment that can be used, for example, to help, s you know, we know how to help someone who's depressed change their outlook on the world, but it's a lot of work to do it just using your imagination and cognitive behavioral therapy. But in a virtual environment, we can reward them uh, for looking at the world a different way. So whoever establishes those standards, are th that's gonna be the next generation of healthcare. So I think there's a fan it's an unexplored territory. There's a big continent to be explored, and we all should help each other. It's not a competitive area because there's so much open space. Um, but there's also a lot of work to be done. So. Okay. Well, I, I think I think. Oh, time's up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, five minutes. Wow. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pardon me. Uh, actually, I was going to ask the audience some questions, um, if that's okay. Please use it. If I have five minutes. You have it. Okay. Um, well, first of all, if other people are working in healthcare, I'd love to have them stand up and, and mention what they're up to. And second of all, um, I guess I'm curious, um, do, is, is, the, is your interest in VR driven by um, a desire to apply a tool to a big problem? If so, I, I'm hoping my words reached you that this is a very important problem that we'd better get moving on right away. So um, if, if it is, come please talk to me afterwards and maybe we can team up on some projects together. Uh, so anybody else working on healthcare in the room here? Oh, fantastic. Um, wh what are you doing? Fantastic. That, that's very important. Um, you, I think you are also working in healthcare. That's such an easy problem, isn't it? <laughs> Very important work. That's great. Great. Fantastic. Good. Oh, 
Oh, fantastic. I'll, I'll definitely be there for that. Well, thank you folks very much. This has been wonderful. I've enjoyed my time here.